I know that we've estimated um, a dynamic regression model. Um, let's continue with uh, using these models to forecast. Now, if you are to use these models forecasting, it's pretty easy. You have to go, you've got two components to this. You've got the regression model and you've got the ARIMA model. And you need to forecast both these and combine them. Now, uh, R and the Fable package will take care of the uh, ARIMA part of the model. Um, but you will need to provide forecasts for the regression part. Now, if some, if we have some predictors, as we did in Chapter 7, that we know their future, time, dummies, or whatever, they're fine. We can give them um, the, the values. Um, now, if we um, have uh, regressors that need to be forecasted, we can either forecast those and provide the forecast, or we can do scenario-based forecasting where we... Uh, give some values, some future values of those predictors. Uh, we need to always remember that when we generate these forecasts, um, the prediction intervals do not include the uncertainty of the predictions of the forecast for these uh, exogenous variables. We are taking those as given, as, as fixed. Um, so back to the US, um, uh, to the simple regression, simple regression uh, with dynamic uh, errors, um, uh, regressing consumption on income. Uh, we're going to use the new data function. We're going to generate forecasts for the next eight steps. And um, we've seen this again in chapter seven. Uh, we're going to pass this uh, new data or this US change future into the forecast function and the forecast function will generate some forecast for us. Uh, we assume here that our future of the US change for income uh, is the mean of my, is the historical average. So is the mean of my historical values. Hence the forecast that I get um, for the next eight quarters look quite reasonable, look quite like this. And uh, here's some prediction intervals for them. Again, remember that these prediction int intervals in practice need to probably be wider as they take the values uh, for the income for the future uh, as, as fixed, as given. Okay. Um, let's have a look at a, another example uh, using daily data. This is a little bit of a more interesting example. So here we have um, daily electricity demand in gigawatts for the state of Victoria in Australia. Um, and we're going to look at the relation between electricity demand and the maximum daily temperature. So here we see um, uh, two types or three types of days that we are focusing on. We're going to look at weekdays and non-weekdays. And there's two types of non-weekdays. We're going to either have so um, weekdays or another two different types, which is a weekend or a holiday or a day that it was a holiday. That can be a weekday or a weekend. Um, so the immediate thing that we see here is that demand of electricity on weekdays is higher than what it is on weekends or holidays. So these uh, green dots, we have the um, orange dots also sort of embedded in them. Um, we see that there's a nonlinear relationship between maximum temperature and electricity demand. As the temperature probably drops below 20, we see electricity in demand increasing um, because of heating requirements. Um, between 20 and maybe maybe 25, 27, it seems that it's fairly flat. And as then temperature increases, we see that electricity demand increases and increases uh, more rapidly than what it does on the other side where now air conditioning is required for uh, cooling purposes. Um, so again, um, just uh, emphasizing that weekdays demand on average um, is above the demand for um, weekends or holidays. If we look at a different plot, we plot these, we plot demand uh, and temperature across time. Um, a few things to notice here, electricity demand in January. Now, remember in Australia, January is, January, February are the summer months, uh, much more variable electricity demand, and that is highly driven by uh, higher temperatures, variability in temperatures. So you can see here, this day is a 40 plus day and electricity demand spikes on that day uh, for air conditioning requirements to cool down. 
Um, the winter months. So uh, in in these months here, where we are going into um, uh, autumn um, and spring, where temperatures are between uh, twenty and twenty five, the month seems to be pretty flat. Um, in the winter months, June, July, August, where temperatures drop, we see the demand increases. And then again, we start getting into, uh, this is a holiday period where demand uh, flattens down um, <clears throat> due to people going on holidays and not using as much electricity. The other thing they want to see here is there's a daily, um, there's, a, there's a weekly seasonality where day of the week plays uh, a role. So we have weekends, which is a trough, and then weekdays are higher, uh, weekends and weekdays and so on. Okay, let's have a first pass at modeling this. We're going to uh, regress demand on temperature and temperature squared. So we're going to use a quadratic to capture this non-linearity. Um, now, we've uh, warned in this book before using quadratics for um, or nonlinear relationships, such nonlinear relationships for forecasting that come with a warning. And the warning is that these are problematic if you're going to use values outside the, your historical ranges. Now here, for when I'm going to use this model for forecasting, I'm going to still consider values for temperature inside the range of this relationship. So I'm going to consider values of maximum temperature between uh, uh, 15 and even 45 degrees, somewhere around this uh, this. Um, relationship so if i go outside those then I, that is problematic so in victoria we rarely have temperatures below 10 degrees or temperatures above uh, um, 48 or so okay so if i do that then it's problematic as long as i stay within these bounds within this range of my historical data then uh, it is it is safe um, and then i'm also going to regress on day type so i'm going to have whether it's a weekday or not a weekday. And remember, not a weekday contains a weekend or a holiday. So here's the estimated model. We see that uh, Fable goes away and estimates uh, the regression model. And the um, regression errors are modeled by an ARIMA 212-200 process. So there's a first order difference in there uh, required. So Fable automatically differences that all the variables estimates the model and returns uh, the estimation output. Um, here are the coefficients of my regression. So here's the coefficient for the linear term. Here's the coefficient for the quadratic term. Here's the coefficient for my dummy variable. So um, if I consider this nonlinear relationship, um, there's a positive difference between weekdays and weekends as there should be. Okay, and that's captured by this coefficient here. If I look at the residuals of my estimated model, um, well, there's a couple of things here. There's where we can notice. Let's start from a time plot. It seems that the variation in the summer months and as we approach the summer months here is higher than the rest of the sample. So maybe a log transformation might help us um, overcome that. The other thing that we see in the autocorrelation function this is daily data and it's lag five. So um, I would not be extremely happy with this. I would want to do something to actually model this um, since it's daily data. Now, if it was something like monthly data or quarterly data, then I'll probably might not really care about this one, but um, it is quite high. So I might think about this twice, but in this case, I'm going to try and model this uh, and see if I can do it better. And I'll show you that in a couple of slides time. If I do a Lumen box test on this, um, yeah, obviously I reject an all of white noise and I could do that. Um, yeah, I think I could do that by looking at these significant spikes. So let's revisit this example and try and do a little bit better. So I'm going to take a log transformation of demand, but I'm also going to get R to work harder and look through more models. So I'm going to set step y is equals to false, but I'm also going to ask it to look a little bit further. So remember, this is lag five. So to capture this, I'm going to um, loosen a little bit of these constraints 
and I'm going to ask her to um, look up to the combination of P and Q being less than or equal to eight and the combination of P and Q seasonal being less than or equal to five. So when my um, when um, Fable goes away and um, does the non-stepwise process and looks through all these combinations, now it returns back a 513, which is a much higher order than what we had before. We had a 212, now it's a 513 model. So let's have a look at the ACF plot. We've done a little bit better with the variance. I can still do things to improve this. Um, we don't do it uh, in this section or in this book, but you can do things to improve this. Um, let's take it as satisfactory at the moment. Now, our ACF looks fairly well behaved, um, so there's no significant spikes, hence um, I've got residuals of white noise. Um, Okay, let's try and forecast now. Uh, again, we're going to use the new data um, and I'm going to um, forecast uh, seven day, uh, 14 days ahead. Uh, actually, this is one day ahead here. I'm just giving an example of what um, the Fable object will look like. So I'm passing a temperature of 26 and it returns a mean value of 163 for um, electricity demand. Let's uh, go a little bit further in this case. So we're going to forecast 14 days ahead. I'm going to set the temperature for the next 14 days to 26 degrees. And this code here tells it whether I have uh, a holiday uh, or a weekday or a weekend. Okay. Here's some forecasts using those future values. So um, we see that towards the end of this sample, um, Electricity demand has decreased due to holidays starting, uh, Christmas period, and this sort of uh, main, uh, leads uh, my next few forecasts to be a little bit lower than the rest um, of the of the demand uh, for the other period. Now, one thing I need to mention here is that although I've taken into account my weekly seasonality, I haven't taken into account my annual seasonality. Um, so this pattern of high variation increase in in um, in uh, electricity demand in the summer months, then going down a little bit in the uh, autumn and then increasing in the winter, decreasing in the, uh, in the spring and so on, uh, or being flat in the spring and so on. Um, I have not accounted for that. Uh, we will revisit and give you um, and, and look at that uh, in uh, chapter 12 of the textbook where we uh, model uh, multiple periods of seasonality. 